Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show episode number 131 with me, your host Agostino. What's going on? What's really good? Hope you're crack-a-lacking in the right way. It's your boy Agostino. Oh! As you can tell, I've got a lot of testosterone this morning because I've been working out like an absolute dog this week. Uh, running, going to the gym, uh, pumping weights, doing all that malarkey. Hence why the camera's so far away. If you're watching on YouTube, listening via the audio, you won't have any idea what I'm talking about. But all the gains are reappearing in this guy's arms, as you can see. Look at that. Look at those gains, man. Look at those biceps coming back in strong. You right? know what I mean? Uh, that's just egg, spinach, and spring onions in there. Right in there, brother. That's what you get, right? When it's just all salad and that. Look at those forearms. Look at those forearms. That's not been jacking off. That's from doing dumbbell curls, I promise. Look at that. Look at those forearms. Look at that beautiful forearm definition right there. No jacking off included. Um, so, yeah, I'm a little bit pumped, a little bit hyped up. Um as per usual, you know, exercising sometimes does that to you. It sometimes gives you a little bit of a ziz. Not not to be confused with the zizzy that fucking uh, Kodak Black is on, you know. Not to be confused with that shit. But it does give you a little bit of a judge. A little bit of a boop, 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 boop. It's weird because you never... I, I don't think I can ever recreate the feeling of going on a long, grueling run. And that feeling when you're just about to hit the last, like, mile or so. And you know you're going to finish... I don't think you could ever, 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 ever recreate that feeling or put it into a pill. Or I don't think you could ever find a comparable um, class A drug that could have the same effect. It's strange, isn't it? For all the advancements that we've had in medicine, in technology of rule, they still can't find something that can replicate that feeling. And that's like, because I remember seeing uh, something the other day. I'm not sure if it was, it might have been an Onion article. It might have been something from BuzzFeed. So it might have been completely bullshit. I remember just seeing a headline. Because nowadays, you know, with people um, uploading loads of clickbaity type um, content onto the internet, for the most part, you can really, um, you can really get a kind of grip. You kind of kind of get a bit of a grip on what's going on in the world just by reading headlines. Especially if you try and do that with the Metro, uh, with any sort of paper that you might see on the newsstand and just try and read the uh, news headlines and quite often if you're if you're kind of a, a perceptive person and you can kind of um you know take in information especially short bits of information you can kind of realize what's actually going on around the world just by reading the headlines or the bylines of articles all over the place so i remember seeing this weird article i saw popped up on the internet that said that some scientists were trying to figure out a way of or they were close enough to figuring out a pill that would allow people to eat exactly what they wanted without gaining any weight. So it wasn't a, technically a get skinny pill, but it was a pill that allowed you not to gain any sort of weight in terms of um, in terms of um, eating habits, right? Now, an interesting question comes up there, right? Because part of the reason why losing weight is so difficult is because it requires you to change um, certain lifestyle habits that you might have, right? So a lot of people will complain, I don't have time, I don't have this, I don't have whatever. But where, everything that people say when it comes to don't have time, whether it comes to I don't have time to work out, time to cook, I work, I don't know, 16 hours a day, I have a family, blah, 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 I came back from a wedding. Everyone's got an excuse they put up there. But whatever excuse they put up, it has always to do with a... There's always like a, a lifestyle habit that needs to be changed. There's always a time constraint needs to be adjusted. So if you have children or if you work a, a long, a, a really long shift, for instance, like you work, I don't know, 10 hours in a day. Some people have those kind of jobs that require you to stay an extra hour or to go or to go into work an extra hour, which might make, you know, and then you don't take a full lunch, you eat at your desk. So you're always kind of on call. If that is, if that happens and you kind of have to make adjustments in the time that you do have free in order to kind of get the work you need to be done. So something needs to be, so a question needs to be um, proposed that if someone wants to give you a pill that prevented you from not getting fat in terms of eating as many muffins as you wanted to, there's also no guarantee that you're also going to get ripped, right? So people sometimes have the assumption that if you don't get fat, then that means you're going to be skinny, but it's not necessarily the case, especially when it comes to your insides. Most of it has to do with the insides. It's like um, when you see people that are smokers. And they can't run for a bus, but they look fairly fit from the outside, quote unquote, right? So they look skinny or they look like they're not carrying too much fat around their body. But, you know, the insides are all shut up. You know, they can't, you know, their cardiovascular system can't put up with their body running for, um, you know, a considerable amount of time. So that's where it gets a bit tricky. And also just the satisfaction of just finishing a run like I did the other day. I ran like four and a half miles that's around my area late at night. And, you know, I'm quite enjoying running late at night, even though it's got its challenges because, you know, 
my eyesight is already as shit as it is anyway. So when you're running late at night, especially within the area that I live in, that isn't well lit up, you know, there's not that many lampposts. You start to realize it, especially when you hang out um, late at night, like I do, especially if I'm going clubbing or if I'm going DJing or if I'm going to, I don't know, going for a run or whatever it may be, or if I'm popping out, because I love to pop out to Tesco's and buy something and shit. A little snack, which is something I've tried to kind of stop in the last few weeks, actually, because I love a little Tesco Express run. Um, but if you're familiar with, if you're if you're kind of used to going out after 7 p.m. or after 8 p.m. when everyone's kind of like, you know, um, clocked in for the night and everyone's going to go sleep and are waiting for the next day, then you would know that, you know, when no one's around and you don't have the hustle and bustle of people on the streets, you start to you start to kind of notice things like around you. You start to notice the shifty characters. You start to notice all the little, all the flipping creatures that aren't even human that come out late at night. You start to notice the noise, uh, the people that drive their cars without any, um, with that that don't turn on the front headlights, headlights, which is really weird. But I see a lot of that in the area, maybe because they're driving without licenses. I don't know. Or without insurance. I don't know. I'm not going to question it. But also one thing you do realize quite quickly is that, um, especially hood areas like where I am in Stratford, there's not many lampposts in the street. So it's really, really fucking dark. There's not many lampposts. And a lot of people in the, in the ends don't necessarily um, have their windows wide open or their curtains, let's say. Everyone's kind of, you know, trying to like protect, you know, trying to you know, have their own privacy. So you don't get none of that glare from the lights of people's houses hitting the streets. You don't get anything. Or for the most part, m- most people, I don't know, maybe because it's a low-income area, trying to conserve energy. Like I remember how my mum was, like, you know, making us, making sure that any room that we weren't in, the lights were off. Which is, you know, it sounds fucking nuts to say it. Like, it sounds a bit obvious, you know. But there's some people out there that, that just have all the lights on in the entire house. Some people, I know some people's houses I walk into, I'm like, Jesus Christ, man, it's so bright. You know what I mean? Because they've literally got a, ha- a light on everywhere. They've got the lamp on, they've got candles, they've got the fucking main hallway light on. Every light's on everywhere. All the doors are open. Like, that's something that we never had in my house. All the, if you were in a room to conserve the heat, you close the doors. So, so you don't have to waste electricity um, money for the heater and stuff. So you start to realize that quite often, but I really enjoy the, the the thrill of running in the night. There's something about running at nighttime that's really, 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 um, I don't know, man. It's so satisfying. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe because I've been so used to running so early in the morning at like 6 and 5 a.m. that I'm kind of loving the nighttime run. But one thing I'm not loving is the fucking cold. It was so bitterly cold when I ran last night. I ran about, what, I think like 6 or half 7 or something like that. No, I think that's, I think 7 o'clock, sorry, just before the United game. And my hands were nearly falling off my arms, mate. It was absolutely chapping, and it didn't get it, did, it didn't get warmer either. You know that kind of cold where you're thinking, okay, once I hit mile one, or once I hit like mile one and a, a mile and a half, um, it'll start getting a bit warmer. Nah, it didn't get warmer at all. It didn't get warmer until maybe the very end, and I had to kind of sprint home. Usually, I kind of do a bit of a 10, 15 minute warm down when I finish a long run. I had to kind of just stop stop it at like five to ten minutes and just say, look, I'm going home, man. I need to have a shower and get you know and get under my duvet and shit. But that was fairly thrilling experience running at night time. So yeah, I'm feeling pretty good, man. It's, it's been it's been a long time since I've done like back to back to back to back to back to back to days of working out. Usually, I take like I said, I always have a little break in between a Wednesday off, but I've kind of smashed it all in. And today, after I finish this podcast, I'm going to go to the gym and get in some more weight training. More weight training. And then hopefully do another session on Friday and kind of like maybe leave the weekend um, for most of my mobility work. But yeah, feeling good, man. Feeling ripped. Ah, ripped. But yeah, apart from that, it's been a fairly, um, uh, what do you call it, uneventful as per usual. Um, yesterday, like an absolute donut, I've suggested myself to watching United play Valencia away from the Champions League. The less said about that, the better. We all know what the issues are there. Mourinho... Um, is probably um, one of the last persons on the list I would blame. But because he's such a dour, negative Nancy, I just want to just like, you know, I'd, I'd like the club to kind of part ways with him just so we can kind of, that kind of dark cloud of negativity can kind of like, you know, remove itself from the club. But it does get me thinking about places I've worked in where you don't like the manager. Because you hear a lot of people saying that, right? Um, About, uh, you know, some people comparing themselves to footballers and saying, oh, I worked a job before. I don't like the manager. Just get on with it. But, I think that oversimplifies the the kind of situation between Mourinho and Pogba because I know when I've worked in places where I don't like the manager, yes, you get on with it, but you don't get on with it well. You don't do a good job. It's sort of like, do you, have, do you remember like when you've you've been at work and you've done something bad, you've made a mistake? I don't know. Like for instance, for me, like I fucked up. I used to fuck up the cashing up on, when I was working in retail so often. My, um, I think number one, because I'm not good with numbers because I always, maths was always kind of my weak spot in terms of educa- education. I excelled in all the diff- all other subjects, you know, art, uh, science, um, English. I was fucking always getting A's, A's to C's, right? All the way through school. I was pretty good at it. 
But maths from the very first moment I interacted with it just stumped me. I think when even in my SATs test, I think I got like five, four, five, four, three in my um, SATs that you do when you're in um, um, primary school. And and the three obviously was in maths and it never got better than that. I was always in the lower sets. I was always in foundation, always in foundation, always something terrible for me. So I think um, subconsciously, I've kind of always avoided doing anything considering, um, concerning numbers. And whenever numbers do come, do come around, I'm usually one of the person to kind of shirk away from it, right? So much so, a few years ago, I remember I used to do this thing where I never liked to look at my cash. I never liked to look at my balance when I was um, taking out money, or I never liked to check my balance on my own mobile on mobile banking, or to check it at the cash point. I'd always just sometimes I'd cover it and just take out money, and if it came out, it came out. It didn't it? Didn't and just spend it until my card was not allowing me to spend anymore, which is fucking insane to think. But but I'm sure there's other people out there that have had the same sort of issue, just going at a cash point, thinking la di da 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 da. Hopefully money comes out. You know what I mean? Like so many sketchy moments like that, man. But now I'm not, I, I'm not that ignorant, and I can't imagine how embarrassing it would be to be like a grown man that I am now to be in the shop and you know buying I don't know some fucking. Um, multi seed bread or some shit, right? And a and a bottle of orange juice, and then having that get denied at the till. You know, the bread in Tesco Express is like fifty p. The orange juice is like one pound twenty nine. You know, you're not spending more than two pound if that. And then it gets denied. It's like fuck. So there's no way, no way in hell that I'm going to fucking Tesco Express without checking my mobile um banking. But that's how bad it was in numbers. And I remember when I made a mistake at work, cashing up, and I, I didn't, I didn't add up the coins properly. I, I did the X Y thing. I don't know the the two receipt. I just fucked up somehow or the other. And you got dressing down at work. That whole day at work was a write off. Yes, you worked, you did your job, but that looming thing in the back of your head of like, oh, you've been told off. Your other colleagues have seen you get um get a telling off from your boss. You feel embarrassed because you made such a big mistake. You feel annoyed because you hate the, you hate your boss anyway as well on top of it. Imagine if you hate your boss on top of it. You hate the person that you work for or, or that you're working underneath and you're just giving them another reason to kind of say something to you and it's just this constant kind of like drilling and brewing away. It's just, you know, it's just, you're thinking all these fucking negative thoughts in your head. So you might do your job but you're still hating life, right? You, you still want to get out there as soon as possible. You can't wait until your lunch break is happen, um, it, it's coming up. You can't wait until you're off to go to, um, you can't wait until you're off for the day. Like, you just can't fucking wait. Um, which is one thing I actually don't miss, actually. I remember that. that, that was a, that's the evolution of working in a working environment. I think work, office life is still kind of dead in general because, you know, at the end of the day, you're not doing what you want to do in life. For me personally, it's still kind of, you know, I'm, especially when I've done my task in the first four hours and I'm spending the last four hours of the day pretending like I'm working, right? Um, and sometimes people can say, oh, no, but you should be proactive and try and make yourself indispensable. Some jobs, um, there's only so much you can do. Some jobs, like, if 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 for instance if for instance i try and be proactive in a workplace right and you get your first, you get your actual role done you get the your occup what you're meant to be doing your kind of to-do list done in the first four hours and then let's say you try and say no i guess you know try and be proactive and go for it and you never know what people what who's watching blah blah blah. all right cool let me take advice so the that day on the last four hours of the day i didn't try and set up set up things i want to do for the, for the next day forward right next day um that's coming up and I do that again the next day, the next day, next day, next next day. They'll come to a, they'll come to a point where there'll be there's only so much preparation I can do because I'm only I'm only um the job that I'm doing for the most part every job that I did do required required a lot of inbound for you to then for you to do that then to do your job. It didn't require it didn't require you using your own initiative. I think if you're working in a role that requires you to do a lot of outbound work, you know, you having to kind of met, you have to kind of structure your own day and kind of set your own KPIs in a so and so way. Then I think it's a little bit easier to do. But for the most part, when you're working in those kind of roles, you're just trying to whittle away the time. And but one thing I don't miss, I'm just thinking about it, is the uh, is when I remember working in retail is that you had to they'd write down what time you were meant to go to lunch. So like if 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 working for somebody. If, if exchanging your time for money wasn't bad enough, right? Because it's the one thing in our lives that we don't, we can't renew, right? We can't renew time. It doesn't matter how rich you are, um, how privileged you are, what your family background is. The one thing that we don't have as a renewable resource is time. So not only are you exchanging some of the best years of your life on this great planet that we're living on right now in order to kind of gain in order for, in order for a monetary gain in order to kind of keep a roof of above your head and just keep yourself above bread line you're not like earning crazy amounts of money that's allowing you to kind of you know um look after your family and shit you're just earning enough money just to kind of keep yourself fed and your closest ones around you entertained no problem if that wasn't enough they're bloody having to tell you when you have to go to lunch they're telling you when you should go eat like that 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 used to blow my mind 
It used to it used to annoy me. It used to annoy me. It still annoys me now having to request a holiday. At least now it's a bit better because you have a bit of a you have a bit of a screen between you and the manager. You usually have like a HR portal. Like I've used Bob, I've used Charlie, I've used a few others. I forgot, I forgot what they're called, right? But they're all the same sort of thing where you kind of you can log in and you can kind of see how many dates you how many days of holiday you have left, and you can kind of request a holiday request and it kind of just pop through your manager's email and then they could approve it or whatever based on the demands of the business. So it's a bit of a screen. But in you know in, in yesteryears, especially um, it, I think now in retail it's probably the same. I, I assume everyone's got like a, a HR portal to have to ask. But I remember back in the day you'd have to write it on the on the sheet on like the um, the rotor that was on the notice board. And then you'd see people, you see loads of broken dreams, shattered dreams on the fucking notice board, marked out in X and in red ink and shit. And you can't take this holiday. It's like, it's fucking brutal. Absolutely brutal. And especially if you work in shift work, like the one thing that you have got, the one thing that is makes the life worthwhile is the, life, is the fact that you can go away on holiday. That makes it, you know what I mean? Because like, you're working, you, you're, you're effectively working seven days a week, right? Rotating schedule. Yes, you have two days off, but you're always fucking on. You don't even have the luxury of having a weekend off. Bank holidays don't exist to you. And then, you know, not, not only that, they're rotating you fucking in lunch. So that was always something that kind of like blew my mind, blew my mind to absolute smithereens. But, you know, I guess you have to do what you got to do. And then I guess also some people in workplaces are annoying too. I think if you're a manager and you, you're, you know, you're managing a team of employees and they're all the type of people that don't forget to take holidays and then are still complaining about what they do. That can be frustrating too. Do you know what I mean? Because the last thing you want is a workforce full of like moany bitches that are always complaining about to one thing or the other and you know and you know as a manager the one thing that's going to sort it one thing that's going to kind of alleviate um their moaningness is them just taking a break you know going away somewhere that's why i've always I've, even to this day i've something i've always done regardless of how cold it is i've always kind of gone out for my lunch break just to have a walk or just to walk around the block it's so it's so important just to kind of have a refresh a bit of fresh air see people around you and sometimes i'll even do it even without headphones for the most part when i um when i do go for a walk I would always carry a book with me anyway, so I'll be, you know, I'll do the first half an hour as a read somewhere. I just try and find a local park and have a read, or the, or for the most part, just a full hour just walking around in circles. And that was very, very beneficial. It just kind of gives you know just a bit of a wake up, a bit of a refresher. It's like when you wake up in the morning and you splash off with a bit of cold water in your face, you know. Really, you should be showering, but you know, if you're on a budget and you and you want to make sure you don't look like you've been up for 17 days, then splash yourself with some cold water and get your day started. That's the message coming from Agostina. But yeah, um, that's I don't know why I got into that tangent, but who knows? Anyway, rolling onto the show, let's get into it because we're already blabbering on about nothing. I have got some new books that I'm reading for December. It's a bit late, I know, during the during the month to kind of introduce some new books in there. I was spending most of my time, especially October and November, catching up on books that I hadn't kind of got got around to reading. I'm not somebody that has to read every single book. Um, from the front to the back, I don't subscribe to that. I think some books, especially the books that I buy, especially if they're in the non-fiction um, side of things, they do tend to kind of repeat the same sort of argument. Once they've, when they've, once they've kind of set forth their argument and they've kind of argued for and against the position that they have and they presented some corroborating evidence and some evidence that is against what they're talking about, it kind of does good divulge into a bit of a spiral of repeating yourself and making the same argument and countering an argument again and again and again and again. The greatest books in the world don't do that and they're able to kind of weave a narrative through that but some of the books are the kind of bit samey so the idea of kind of like dumping a book and saying you know what i've read this and i think this is enough and i've got and i've got the gist of it is good because i'd rather read the book and get the gist of it and kind of extract the value that i can out of it than you know uh brutalize myself by trying to get through a book that is just not vibing with me and something ha sometimes happens though. sometimes it happens that you read a book and in later years it then kind of um resonates with you um a few years later it's something that you don't kind of like it doesn't so it doesn't kind of like click with you at the moment, but you need to kind of give it a break and come back to it. I'm assuming the same thing happens with movies, happens with TV series, happens with music sometimes. Like you listen to an artist, you're like, you know what, I don't really like he or she, but then you come back later, you're like, you know what, I actually get all the hype now. I understand it. Blah blah blah. So anyway, um I spent most of my October and my November catching up on those books. Some some of them are great, some of them are bad. Some of the great ones that I've kind of just about finished is this Flash Boys by Michael Lewis, which is an inc incredible, incredible book that kind of uh, details the stock exchange meltdown during kind of the early 2000s and what kind of uh, transpired in order to, what kind of caused that kind of blackout so I recommend you check that if you're in, in kind of be curious about you know things that all things concerning the stock exchange and what happened there in the mid 2000s I recommend you check that out too um, but the books I have for this month are as follows oh it's always nice getting books from 
Amazon anyway. They, they do well to fucking package them. Oh, this was bent actually, but anyway. Get these all up here. So, got these four books here, as you can see. I'm going to put it up to the camera. And then sit there. There they are there. Get a good little, uh, what's, your, what's that thing called? A thumbnail for the video later. Got a good little picture there. Like, aha! You know that surprise face everyone puts on YouTube. <laughs> but anyway, um, doesn't really matter for audio listeners. But anyway, so I've got four, got four books here that I'm trying to read through um, the month of December. Now, it's not, it's, it's not that I need to finish them all by December, but my aim is to try and get most of them finished by December. As you can see, there's fair, there's a fair amount of paper there. About I think I calculated it's just over two thousand pages front to back in all these books, so it's going to be a lot to get through. But as always, you know. So it's good to set yourself um, little stretch goals to achieve and stuff like reading is the same is kind of similar to any sort of other hobby you might have in order to in order to kind of give it as much time as you as, as it needs to you know in order to kind of reach the goal that you want you have to eliminate other things you have to kind of prioritize you have to sacrifice some things so i might not be on my phone as much i might not be on the internet as much i might not be listening to podcasts as much um there's things that I have to sacrifice or like, for instance, like now in the, like I'll, I basically read two hours a day. I read the first, I read the first time. The first thing I grab in the morning is a book. So when I, once I'm waking up, before I'm going to go to the gym, I'll, I'll have a book on the side of my bed. I'll turn the bedside lamp on and just start reading a few pages for an hour or so. In the morning, it's a bit difficult because I'm quite groggy, but I just try and wake myself up with some, you know, with some good reading material. And then in the evening, I'll read for an hour and then maybe an hour extra. So I might read for another two hours. So about, about three hours of reading each day. Now, it's a little bit easier if you've got a commute to work and stuff. You could actually cheat. So imagine I could have... Uh, I can read for an hour in the morning and then I can read again another hour to work and then that's another hour maybe at lunchtime and then on the way back you have another hour so you're kind of cheating all those little commute options that you're doing it's a good little way to cheat and the other day when I went to go do my food shopping in Lidl uh, because it's always fucking super rammed in there and the queue's always super long I just took a book with me instead of taking a podcast and just kind of read a few pages on the you know in the queue when you're in the stores and stuff it's a bit weird you know because no one reads books anymore so when you are reading in public people always look at you and give you the kind of side eye like as if like you think you're smarter than everyone which obviously i think i am um but no um it's always a bit strange isn't it? you you get more looks from strangers reading a book than you would do anything else it's, it's fucking bizarre isn't it i guess because such a an old school way of kind of consuming information and there's there's probably not that many of us out there that are, you know, consistently buying books and shit. I understand that in some respect, but it can get a bit annoying. But hey, ho, what can you do? Anyway, I've got four books here. Number one book that I've got here is Noam Chomsky, Who Rules the World. Uh, brief synopsis on the book is Who Rules the World is Noam Chomsky's rigorous examination of the dark currents underlying some of the major issues of our times. From the secret history of the US to Cuba... Um, to China's global ascent from torture memos to sanctions to of, of, on Iran. He explores how the United States talk of freedom and human rights is often at odds of its actions. Delving into delving deep into the conflicts of Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, Palestine, he offers terrifying picture of the inner and outer workings of modern day imperial power. This already I've started reading. I'm about three quarters away through, as you can see from the bunny ears here. Um, an incredible book so far. It's weird because it mentions a couple of books I've already got in my collection, like the Robert Frist book that kind of details the rise of al-qaeda so it kind of ties in a lot of that too so i recommend you check that as well um you know Noam chomsky is one of our four our foremost leading um public intellectuals out there uh i've got this book called two called a little life which i had on my reading list for a while and i feel few people on my instagram have commented that it was a bit of a slow long read but it's a bit of fiction, so um, I, which I don't necessarily read. So I'm, I'm intrigued to kind of get through this at the moment. I haven't read any backstory to it. I've kind of mentioned a few. I've seen a few people on my Instagram say, oh, it's a really long read. It's really slow and laborious. But I purposely not looked into what the book's about. I just want to kind of go into it blind. So that's going to be something I'm going to be eager to kind of delve into. And usually fiction books, I'm quite good at kind of tearing through them really quickly. I kind of read it like a movie. I'm always like, really curious. Oh, what's going to be the next chapter? What's going on? <laughs> so that should be pretty easy to read. Um, then I've got Chasing the Scream by uh jonah harari or johan harari johan harari johan harari have you pronounced his name and um, he's been on a bit of a speaking tour as of late because he's got a book out recently that kind of deals with mental health i think because he's been suffering those issues at the moment i think that's a book 
at the moment. I think he's got an interview at the moment recently with Sam Harris, so maybe check that out. You can want to know who he is. But a brief synopsis of this at the back um, it says, drugs are not what we think they are. Addiction is not what we think it is. And the war on drugs is not what we see on our TV screens. In Chasing the Scream, um, Yohan Harari shares his discoveries through the riveting stories um, he uncovered on a 30,000-mile journey from the founder of the war on drugs who stalked and killed Billy Holiday to transcend a crack dealer in Brooklyn to the only country that has ever discriminalized all drugs with remarkable results you'll never look at addiction or our society in the same way again don't they do that in portugal right portugal is legalized i think most um uh what you call it um personal consumption of drugs right so if you've got like a an amount i think it might be under seven grams then you can you can carry it you know what i mean for all all class a drugs and they've kind of cracked that mold so that might be a good way to put place to go for some holidays and for some of you motherfuckers but yeah so that that's cool and obviously the you know i'm always intrigued about reading um kind of books that kind of detail the the failings of the war on drugs and just the whole drug economy for the most part because it ties into so many facets of our um of society that you know unless from the outside looking in you just think it's a couple of back gang bangers that are just you know fucking it up for everyone but the 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 octopus tentacles of the drug game run deep when you once you read those kind of books like i said um if you read uh, roberto saviano's zero 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 which i have somewhere around here it kind of details that a lot i think i've got it down here actually down there uh zero 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 roberto saviano who's also the um the, the person that wrote the original book called gomorra which is an italian tv series i think that was on sky atlantic that's fucking amazing if you like if you like the sopranos and you want to see a real authentic version or if you like narco for instance and you want to see like an italian version or european version of narcos i recommend you check out gomorra it's fucking incredible and then last but not least i've got the laws of human nature by robert green i've mentioned this a few times because obviously i've got mastery by robert green i've got 48 laws of power which is up here too one of my other favorite books as well um but yeah i'm a big fan of robert green um his books are always fucking riveting always amazing i thought mastery was one of my favorites from him kind of detailing masters over in all in in different fields and kind of breaking down systemic uh systematically just what it takes not to be a master in that kind of field and kind of um demystifying it like it's not just all like some great there are there are aliens aliens do exist right lionel messages do exist but for the most part um most of us can turn ourselves into kind of worst class performers within our our domain of expertise if we kind of are methodical in our approach you know we commit a, the necessary time you want to kind of get better at it we are critical of our work we're able to kind of step back from it blah 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 there's loads of things i really can check that out and loads of human nature is obviously an extension of all those kind of books now um the, 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 at the back reason that's what it says here you're about to become an apprentice in human nature first the laws will work to transform you into a calmer more strategic observer of people helping you to free from all the emotional drama that needs to strain you which i think i'm fairly okay at doing at the moment but you know it's always good to kind of um learn further about a certain subject Second, the laws will make you a master interpreter of the cues that people continually emit, giving you a much greater ability to judge their character, which is perfecto. Third, the laws will empower you to take on um, and outthink the toxic taps who have inevitably crossed your path, which is very, very apt to me at the moment. And then fourth, uh, the laws will teach you the true lovers, the true levers for motivating and influencing people, which is something that I've kind of struggled with a lot. I've mentioned it a few times about not trying to be too rah-rah with some people, um, not always trying to solve other people's problems and allowing them to kind of go through their own their own shit um all those kind of things i've kind of mentioned previously in the past and then fifth is uh the laws will give you the power to alter your own negative patterns which obviously is, is again something that i need to do so yeah so there's four books i'm reading for this month i cannot wait to get started um, i've already started on a few of them now at the moment so that's four there big baby babies reading is fucking amazing i actually love it it's one of my favorite hobbies i have at the moment um it's really good at, uh, it's just really a good exercise of calming the mind i've already been quite good with the whole social media stuff i kind of post and dump on instagram i check in sporadically from here there on, on facebook which is weird isn't it because most people my age are mostly on instagram but I'm, i mostly spend my time on twitter and facebook which is fucking crazy but even there i kind of check in check out check in check out and i've kind of done a good job of it but reading does really help in terms of allowing me to kind of step away and unplug from all that social media malarkey Anyway, enough about my reading. On to some topics that I saw during 
the week that I kind of want to speak to you about. This is one of the good topics, is actually, or a good, um, what you call it, segue into what I was mentioning in terms of, you know, workplaces and how people kind of moan and shit. Because it's something that's always intrigued me. I don't know. It's something I've always kind of, I'm, I'm not, I'm not fully on the whole Joe Rogan train of like, you know, you shouldn't, people shouldn't be working in cubicles and shouldn't be working these menial jobs and eight hours a day is crazy. I'm not for, I'm not fully on that, on that train i think maybe some jobs don't require you to work maybe five days a week i think some jobs you can really get away with. you can you can legitimately argue that some jobs don't require you to be in there monday to friday i think some of my some of the people that i know who work in content marketing or marketing in general or the community manager like i've done in the past can attest to this if you're if you're really honest i think most of them would say they don't need to be working in a job uh, monday to friday all days of the week to do their job you can maybe pick out the most you know high traffic days and kind of concentrate on doing your best work there but i'm just intrigued about the general aptitude that people have when it comes to those kind of you know especially office work i think for the most part i think entry level entry level job people are a little bit more cutthroat a little bit more um what you call it emotionally detached from the job that they're working in whereas people you know people that work in i don't know uh drive throughs at mcdonald's and shit or whatever they know what a gig is they know why they're there they know that they're just to cut the check they're not you know i mean nothing kind of phases them for the most part but i think the the people that are in the kind of mid-entry to kind of like you know higher up roles i think that's where you can kind of get a little bit um disillusioned just because you know you maybe have been studying that area of your job. You studied it in university. Maybe it was just something that you were kind of aiming to get um, at for a long period of, of your career. You were kind of maybe working in bars and you suddenly then become a marketing assistant and you're like, oh my God, this is so shit. It's not even, it's not as half exciting as it was to be in a bar um, working and moving around. You're kind of just stuck on your laptop, not talking to anyone. Like it can get, it. the reality is usually a lot more, you know, how do I say? It's a lot more... Um, the reality doesn't really live up to your dream sometimes when those kind of roles. Unless you're one of the lucky few who are able to kind of, you know, work in a job that's like right in your lane. You kind of you kind of join just as the just as the, the company's about to spurt you kind of join as well in a team that you know is going to bring in the best out of you blah 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 blah. that can exist but for the most part sometimes the reality doesn't match up with it but i'm always intrigued about people that work entry-level jobs because i think that's usually the training ground of like real of building up character right of, of building up a, a a resilience to the arrows and the bullets that you're going to receive in life later on and this video kind of details that in spectacular form spectacular form i'm gonna play it now for you and you can kind of get an idea of what i'm talking about here we go attentional shoppers associates and management i would like to say to all of you today that nobody should work here ever our managers will make promises and never keep them. And not only that, they will preach to us about how they care about their employees. But about a month ago, my boss, assistant manager Cora, called me a waste of time and management did nothing to help. Oh, Cora! Management will also try and save money every step of the way, including cutting benefits of a part uh, or a full-time associate down to part, down to part-time, even though he worked 40-plus hours a week. Jesus Christ. I've been a loyal employee here for over a year and a half, and I'm sick of all the bullshit, bogus write-ups, and my job. <laughs> and you hear people clapping in the background amazing i fucking love it <laughs> oh you gotta love it but that but that always that that's 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 the, that's the kind of that's the that's the um the sad thing about entry-level jobs for the most part they're quite fun right you meet some interesting people you meet some really cool people some people that you kind of gonna have friendships with for the rest of your life you kind of meet people that are going to leave a, a permanent imprint in your life right they're going to change you in ways that you've kind of never even imagined would happen you meet some amazing people but um over time because of just the, the because of the um, transient nature of the job it just there's such a high turnover of staff that eventually what what made it fun kind of stops being fun anymore because the people change because that's that's part of the reason why the jobs are good those entry-level jobs not because you're working not not because working in walmart is you know you know is gonna excite you or thrill you the thing that makes working at walmart great especially working a night shift or whatever it may be is that the night shift team is fucking amazing you work with some great people um it's, it's jokes on end it's always banter there's always some sort of crazy thing that happens it's amazing but then the moment as the years as the months progress and the years go on 
people start to leave, people get families, things change, management changes, and usually the management thing is the one that fucks it up when a new manager comes in, and you know, you can't, you know, you can't begrudge them for wanting to come in and kind of put their stamp on a team, but they make little changes, they fuck things up a little bit, and they just suck the living fun out of any job that you had that was fun previously, and it's absolutely, like, it's one of the things that kind of drives me nuts, like the, the, the human, um, desire to come in and kind of tweak things and just you know want to piss all over stuff and leave your mark on it like just just continue the good work that's already there i never understood that idea that you know it's like it happens a lot in tv networks for a tv series or whatever it may be right a new executive will come in um for a channel and then um that new executive will scrap whatever show that our previous executive brought onto the um, channel because they want to um kind of you know write their own legacy but i never thought that was a good i never thought, i never kind of bought into that kind of idea because if anything, um, ensuring that a show continues and is successful for years on, uh, regardless of the managerial changes, is probably more of a credit. It's probably more of a pat on the back for the executives that comes in because everyone knows it's hard to kind of continue to consistently have a show that does well. But, you know, there's, there's always that tendency with managers to come in and just kind of make their changes because they want to, you know, leave their stamp on things. It always fucks up that way. But, it's just funny like, hearing his kid speak and saying that he was loyal to Walmart, which is kind of the thing that is this, that kind of breaks my heart about these kind of draws with people as well, is that they always, always, always buy in. More. They always buy. I think entry level people buy in because uh, I've been that person myself. We buy into the dream more than anyone. We're probably more passionate than anyone that's in that company, which is why sometimes entry level people, when they get overlooked for um, head office jobs, it always breaks your heart because you're like, for sure you care more than a person that has a job you will put in more hours you'll give your everything for the role but sometimes that over eagerness that willingness to do whatever it takes in order to kind of get the job done especially for the person that's working in the office and just you know like i mentioned previously he's getting their job done within the first four hours they don't want that kind of energy around them because you're going to show them up they'd much rather you just you know stay in the shop floor or stay out of reach within the, within the head office it's you know it's fucking annoying it's really it's really really frustrating but you can understand why that kind of thing happens happens um but yeah being loyal to walmart is crazy it's like trying to be loyal to tesco you're not loyal they're not loyal to you that uniform it, as long as you fit in that uniform anyone gets a job the moment you walk out in it someone else walks straight back in they have they must have like a imagine what the waiting list is for um an entry can you know just being a uh what you call it a shelf packer at tesco especially nowadays with how hard it is to get jobs or how it is to you know i don't know to kind of make that next step up or get a bit of money in your pocket it's not, you know, they're not loyal to anyone. If anything, they're probably doing you a favor by giving you a job. But I can, I can appreciate the passion. And also one thing I can appreciate is that when a job starts getting shitty and you're not liking it, you leave. You don't sit there and complain and bitch and whine like a little baby. You pack up your bags like a big girl and you walk across the road and you go somewhere else. Doesn't matter if you haven't got a job for a while. Doesn't matter if you're going to be scared about having money. If it angers you that much because i've never i've never really understood people that can go to bed right go to bed pissed off at because they're working in a role and they're fine with it like oh and i'm just gonna go to bed and you know have this or wake up in the morning and you know not be dreading the day that they're gonna have to go into work or or you know you're on holiday and you're already fucking dreading having to go back and all this shit like that would drain me that's a not i, I can't even go to bed angry after having an argument right i have to kind of squash me before i go to bed because it's going to kind of play on my mind i don't want to have those thoughts in my head in general right so imagine being at work every single day hating it. Nah, man, just leave. Just leave. Leave it. Obviously, leaving out that kid's probably not the best thing to do because you know you're not you're not gonna have the hallowed reference, which I've never got as well. Fuck a reference. Who cares? Just put your mate's name on it and he can do it for you. But um, and don't again. That's not advice. I'm just saying. I'm just saying what I saw on the internet. <laughs> um, but yeah, if if it's not if it's something that you're not enjoying at the moment, just go, man. Pick up your bags and leave. There's always other places that you can go and get employed at. You know, it's not really not that serious, but yeah, I thought that was interesting. Is I've always had those kind of fantasies of quitting jobs that way. I've never done, I've done them that you know that well. To be honest, it's always kind of been you know sending in an email and getting given a notice period and waiting you know diligently until you have to leave and shit. It's never been that dramatic. We kind of like you know on the tunnel like my check one two hello um shoppers of tesco this is agostino i just want to say that i fucking hate this place you know it's never been that cool it's always been just been you know it's always been kind of by the book or getting given the boot like fuck off we don't want you anymore so um that's been kind of my um trajectory when it comes to leaving places but i thought that video was kind of entertaining um but yeah uh, next thing which I'm sure a lot of people won't agree with me, and I'm probably gonna get some comments. Oh my god, you leave her alone! 
you know what right i fucking love the girl um i think she's a modern day cinderella story and i really appreciate the fact that you know someone of her ilk has been welcomed into the modern into the royal family but i think at this point it's not just her it's all women on social media it's all prospective mums i've had enough man enough with these baby bump pictures enough with this over glorification or this kind of like adoration us we're meant to worship at your feet because you've shock horror done what you're biologically made to do right you have the you have the tools within your body right to create human life don't get me wrong it's fucking amazing every time someone gives birth that is close to me or within my family or within my friendship circle it always kind of takes me back especially when they're my age because i think to myself oh my god i'm so immature i'm so dumb how the fuck would i i can't even picture myself having a kid it's fucking incredible right that i could some i i have i have i have the faculties i have the you know the bodily um i have the flipping bodily organs that allow me to somehow contribute to some sort of a being being brought up or sprouted within the belly of another female it's fucking insane it blows my mind but 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 everyone does it it's not that amazing everyone fucking does it like let's chill the fuck out with these kind of you know oh the hardest job in the world is being a mother like as bill burr says like really really is it I, I'm not too sure if it is, man. There's plenty of other jobs out there that are equally, if not much harder than being a mother. What the fuck is going on here? And here she was, Meghan Markle, you know, again, Me Meghan Merkel or Meghan Markle. I don't have any pencil or surname. She came, um, she kind of announced her baby bump at the British um, Fashion Awards the other day that I kind of made a video on about Virgil and Samuel Ross winning. And she stood there, you know, like a, like a, I don't know, like a living Oscar statue holding her baby bump to the whole world to see. And it's just, I just find it weird, man. I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to find it normal. I just find it a bit strange that this is kind of something to lord and oh my god she's being a mother she's doing what she's biologically made to do it's like come on man and i already saw I've, I've i've even seen a couple of videos or a couple of headlines people saying they're criticizing i think because she's wearing is she wearing black nail polish they criticize that for some reason i don't know why i'm not going to read into that because you know those people are fucking ridiculous but come on man yes she's pregnant i understand it's a big deal because it's Meghan markle and you know she's not the conventional princess and blah 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 but enough is enough i hope this is the end already that beyonce thing that she did when she was like you know behind that weird lace curtain and with all the ornaments and shit that made me bath inside my mouth but that was you know that was kind of creative i kind of understood you know the kind of um furore around that one and try and get that one up quickly actually uh beyonce pregnant um you know and loads of people fucking copied her you know announcement uh, you know her kind of baby bump announcement this is it got, got copied the world over which you know it's kind of keen that people were copying this but this was quite original for the most part and this is kind of this is during the era when beyonce was her creative direction of her team it's just insane in general right so yeah everyone's making a big deal out of it and she's generally quite a private person and the end of the day it's fucking beyonce and it was fucking twins i get it cool whatever but enough is enough now we've done we've done it already it's too much everyone's doing this thing it's too much enough enough i've had enough of this your women you're biologically made to you know to bless us with fucking children and repopulate this dying earth that we're living in great but come on man look at the glee on her face i'm pregnant guys look i'm pregnant like yeah you're pregnant you're a woman you know some guy busted in you without a condom you're pregnant man what do you reckon would happen he busted all sort of royal nuts inside of you and you're pregnant great amazing hope your kid doesn't end up looking at trippy red but we, uh, apart from that great man but fucking hell enough is enough 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 but yeah i'm happy for her she looks fucking cute um i'm sure the baby's gonna be hot as fuck regardless male or female this baby's gonna be an absolute dime oh piece you know that for sure right but oh come on man enough i've had enough of it i've had enough and I just saw that. I was like, Jesus Christ. But I guess, you know, imagine the, imagine the screams and the hooting and hollering in the British Fashion Council um, crowd. And they saw her. Oh, my God. She's having a baby. Fucking clapping eels. Like, oh, enough. Enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I sound like a fucking misery, Gus, but it is what it is. Anyway what else um google trends report for 2018 is out i think um everyone's kind of going crazy about this i saw this online and not that many interesting results that i'm that curious about so again maybe just refresh it and see if there's anything that i kind of missed but you know they kind of did a year in search uh, detailing some of the things that people have been searching in the year 2008 this is obviously um located based on on united states for the most part um so number one searches here let's get this up on the screen um 
you can find this i'll i'll touch it on the notes but you can find this at trends.google.com it's got them all listed down they just change location based on where you are or if you're curious to see other places so they've got the top five searches um is for united states overall is number one world cup hurricane florence mac miller kate spade and auntie bourdain which is quite sad right considering the three other five are concerning dead celebrities um auntie bourdain's death is something that i still kind of you know i, I still haven't watched because I, I had it queued up for ages. I was going to kind of get through, especially during um, the Christmas holidays and stuff. I had, uh, I, had the, I had the idea that I was going to um, watch a lot of, what should we call it? How do you say? Uh, Parts Unknown, the Anthony Bourdain documentary or, I mean, TV series that's, that was on CNN. No, that's, you know, that's been on Travel Channel and the likes. And I think um, Netflix have most of them on there. Um, I was going to watch episodes of Layover as well that I fucking loved for Manti Bourne. I thought that was one of his best ones that he'd done as well. Um, but yeah, I haven't got around to watching it just because it cut me up so much, man. I love Anti Bourdain. Now, again, Anti Bourdain came around for me during the time I started reading The Four Hour Work Week by Timothy Ferris, who also wrote this book that I have down here somewhere, which is called The yeah, Time of Mentors. He's also got Four Hour Body and a few other books. Um, what other book he's got? I think that might be the three books, right? No, and for our chef as well. So Timothy Ferris kind of uh, spearheaded this idea about uh, becoming, uh, you know, about um, kind of demystifying the idea of being location independent. And the whole four hour work week premise was that you can, you know, start an online business that would allow you to only work four hours a week. You can kind of automate most of your processes. Sort of similar to what's happening nowadays with like, you know, Kylie Jenner's uh, makeup line, right? Um, for the most part, why she was valued at a billion dollar company or, or, person or the brand that she represents sorry the brand that she's created why that was rate why that was kind of prospected that much money was because for the most part i think she's only got like four full-time staff and everything else is kind of outsourced manufacturing whatever it may be in her office is just one room with people on laptops so effectively you could do the same thing by being location independent and living in the middle of thailand or somewhere right where the rent is fairly cheap and still be selling stuff online and making quite a good income and having to check in, you know, sporadically four times a week. I mean, four hours a week uh, instead of, you know, what we're doing now in terms of working for three or five hours a week. So that's when that book came along to me. And it was when I was traveling um, through Nicaragua, re re visiting a friend there. And I was just trying to like, you know, the kind of penny dropped. I didn't want to work for anyone for the rest of my life. And I kind of want to do my own thing. So, and then when I saw Auntie Bourdain's TV show, and I saw this kind of older dude who kind of only made it like kind of late in life, but had all these amazing experiences that he had because he worked in kitchens of restaurants all over america and that kind of allowed him to kind of have an appreciation for uh, stories of people from different areas from different parts of the world through food and then he parlayed that into a book um kitchen confidentials i think his autobiography is called well kind of um uh, novels called and then that kind of parlayed into tv shows just it, it was incredible he had basically the best job on earth right i think every dude or every girl out there um every person i think in general when you watch that show you just can't but help but be envious of his you know of his life and what he kind of gets up to he kind of gets paid to travel around the world eat great food and drink loads and connect to some of the most you know influential um people within the culinary industry um and yeah so that has cut me up so much i haven't read i haven't read the book which i still have in my collection somewhere i haven't read i haven't watched any of the shows on netflix man so yeah it's sad to see that that was one of the top five searches but yeah that was one that cut me up really really bad um kate spade as well obviously because i met i bumped into andy spade when i was in new york um back in the day um and he was really really cool a really amazing dude and they were like you know the quintessential power couple in new york you know um andy spade um, and Kate Spade so yeah when she died that was something that kind of caught me off guard and because obviously you meet these people and you can only imagine the kind of pain that they're going through so that's kind of sad to see in general but yeah those are the top five searches um and then the top five for news was World Cup Hurricane Florence Mega Millions of course election results Hurricane Michael um people demi lovato megan markle brett kavanaugh logan paul Claire Kardashian. so that might be the five top the five most famous people in 2018 were demi lovato which is a sad story because it was involving a drug overdose oh, no or was it overdose it was overdose yeah it was uh she relapsed and went overdose megan markle of course a quintessential princess story that i just shaped on a minute ago brett kavanaugh um being accused of sexual assault when he was 16 and that stuff that whole story was fucking insane i think not 16 I think 18 or something in college right logan paul obviously he's continued controversy but he just he's he's another one like trump and he's he's flipping bulletproof isn't it like nothing sticks to him 
I think the internet want to get him out of here so quickly, but it doesn't it doesn't stick. His show got um I think his YouTube Red show came back out again the other day. Um, even though PewDiePie one is still got it still got shelved. Um, Logan Paul's show came back. Um, he's now got he's I think he's now started a po- a podcast right. Uh, I forgot what it's called. Um, I think it's called Impulsive or something like that. It plays in the name, so that, that's on there. And of course, Chloe Kardashian's extramarital um, difficulties. I'm assuming, and just general. I, mean, I think maybe because she lost weight and got fit again. That's why people were searching and the whole her boyfriend uh, cheating on her when she was pregnant and shit. I don't know, but yeah, that was what. And then World Cup teams: Mexico, Brazil, Germany, Argentina, Croatia. England went on there, which is funny to see. Um, what else on here? The top five what? Translation. Comma what? That's weird. Como para la prison, prison alta, como decora una sala. I don't know what that is. What is, what is, what is. I think that's Spanish, right? I'm pretty sure. Hmm. Or did that change the language? I know mean, I didn't change. I don't know. I don't know why that says a different language. Um, Donde quiero reset. I don't know. Yeah, loads of, it's all different language. I don't know why here. Anyway, top five beauty questions, which is interesting here. Number five, how do cat, how did to do a cat eye? Number four, what hair color looks best on me? Which is funny. Um, number three, how to remove individual eyelashes. Uh, what is lash lift? I don't know what lash lift is either. What is lash lift? I don't want to search for that. Fuck that. How to pack magnetic eyelashes. Jesus Christ. That could be that, that could be a shop in itself, isn't it? Just have that as a shop. That, that's your, that's your uh, user research right there. Top five athletes. Um, five, Kawhi Leonard. Levon Bell. Uh, Lindsay Vaughan, Sean White, Tristan Thomas. Everything has to do with controversy for the most part, isn't it? Tristan Thomas, obviously, the Kirk Kardashian stuff. Sean White, I'm assuming for that blackface thing he did when he went to a party. Lindsay Vaughan, I don't know who that is. Levon Bell, I'm not sure who that is. And Kawhi Leonard, because um, he laughs like a robot. Um, actors, again, um, five, Michael B. Jordan, Pete Davidson. I'm assuming because of uh, Ariana Grande, Sylvester Stallone. I'm assuming because of Creed. Bill Cosby, I'm assuming because he rapes women when they go to sleep. Uh, after he slips them with Mickey and Logan Paul in controversy. Everything has to do with controversy. Oh, top five diet. That's quite interesting here. We've got number five, Mediterranean. Uh, four, Carnivore. Three, Nom. And two, Dubro diet. I don't know what the fuck a Dubro diet is. Um, one, Keto diet. Okay, fairly cool. See it there, but yeah, that's fairly interesting. I think if you like, if you if you if you like me, I like a uh, purveyor of the internet, and you like to search things, and you're always on it, then I recommend you check it out. It's always kind of interesting to kind of go through it, similar to the kind of Pornhub uh, most search things, which I haven't kind of actually gone through. I might actually save that for another episode and kind of go through that. It'd be interesting to see what is the most searched for um, porno videos in the UK, just for research purposes, not for my own uh, jacking off material. But yeah, I recommend you check out the Google Trends list that's available at the moment. Anyway, enough about trends. Moving on in, moving on up. What's next on the ticket, docket, slip, line up as it may be. But, 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 Farfetch acquires stadium goods for 250 million. Yeah, man. Big news, isn't it? Sneaker industry is a billion dollar industry. As I've said multiple times, I've written a few blog entries about this on why I hate a Max Day, why I said sneakers need to make their minds up, which I might link actually in the show notes so you to check out, but I recommend you do. Um, but, you know, sneaker industry, we all know it's a big billion dollar industry because, you know, we have these um, services like Go, like stadium goods. Um, like um, StockX, which are even which kind of kind of an evolution of um, what was that thing called? Uh, Flight Club. There's kind of a, a step up from Flight Club, right? These consignment stores that are now allowing people to buy limited edition shoes wherever you are in the world, as long as you have the money to buy them. Limited edition shoes have kind of it's sort of like top tower a little bit. I think, especially um, a good example is the Cold Wall um, collection with Nike, right? From from the last time I checked on Dover Street Market most of the size of the shoes were still available now it, it needs to be said that the cold wool trainer is not um is not a, a particular model that hype beasts are generally fond of i think it's probably a little bit too avant-garde for your general hype beast consumer who kind of wants you know the quintessence who's kind of more apt to buy an air force one a jordan that gets reworked it's a little bit more easier to buy but i thought that was fairly interesting to see that the shoe that you know in, in yesteryears, this shoe would have been sold out in fucking seconds, but I remember it still being available. Maybe if I go back to here and I go back to maybe a Cold War, let me see. But I remember seeing on the Dover Street Market site, it was still available. And that was kind of an indication to me that maybe it's kind of all kind of topped out a little bit and you need to kind of chill out and take it easy. For instance, yeah, this is the one, right? 
So the Nike a Cold War uh, Zoom v- Vomen Vomero, right? That's a that just came out the other day. And I think it's probably one of the best collections they've done so far in that whole collaboration. I think the clothes are amazing. I think what Sammy Ross did, everything is fucking cool. I thought the store installations were great. It's one of the best ones. And then to be honest, as soon as I get paid, this is the shoe that I'm buying, right? So I'm not gonna, I'm not saying so it's a slight. So for me, I'm happy with it. I don't, I don't really mind that I saw that because again, I'm, I'm not really. I try and buy stuff that isn't the kind of quintessential hype beast taste, but this kind of shows for me that maybe it's kind of leveling out a little bit and it's not maybe as being i think that they, it's, it's too much right for instance like the jerry lorenzo the all these shoes they're all coming out at sort of the same sort of time it's, there's not there's there's not enough time to breathe if people are complaining about albums right hear people on shows all the time on, on hip-hop shows on podcast shows that can, might kind of annoy some people where they're like oh have you heard this so-and-so album no i haven't heard it and it kind of can be annoying but if you think about it and if you think that you know you you know you live your everyday life you have your family whatever it may be Imagine there are an amount of releases that come out, right, that aren't to do with hip-hop and then include all the other music that you're going to listen to. It's very difficult to kind of get through all the songs, to get through all these projects, especially now when artists are trying to game the system by having albums that have more than 10 tracks on them, right? So you can get more spins, more plays on kind of Spotify or whatever it may be. So if people can't get through albums, Imagine shoes that are coming out 10 a penny. There's always something. If you go on drop date and you scan through the list of shoes that are coming out over the next couple of weeks, it's insane, right? It's insane. Especially if you're not brand loyal and you don't care about only repping one brand, you could buy literally a shoe a day until the end of time. But um, this is probably a good example of the fact that maybe it's a bit, you know, it's getting a little bit too crazy, but also also maybe underlines why um, Farfetch decided to acquire stadium goods for so much money so this is a new collaboration of course from um a cold wall the zoom vomero and it's available in most sizes a full kind of a full size run except for a few sizes in between from an eight to a ten half size in between so it's available full size run in both colorways which is fu- which is insane you would never get that in, in previous years right in both colorways it's fully available in most of the kind of popular sizes that will kind of get resold so that maybe is, a, is an indication that it might have top to top leveled out a little bit for the most part but i saw this and thought it was quite interesting that they acquired stadium goods because for the most part StockX is the one that people kind of talk about quite highly i know from perusing from um us based um forums a lot of people say stadium goods is quite overpriced and it isn't what it used to be quote unquote but a lot of people kind of prefer using StockX, which i used a couple of times which i think is fucking an amazing service StockX is one of the best the best the best the best you can just buy you just buy it you can just bid for an item you can also be cheeky but you can just buy it um uh, and an item it gets authenticated at the warehouse before it gets to you and yeah the shipping the turnarounds was fucking amazing if anything i can't wait for them to kind of elevate a little bit further instead of being the middle the middle person acting as a middle person same with grailed i'd love it if they kind of especially with the, i'd imagine they might do it with the top sellers where they would kind of uh, take their inventory into their kind of quote-unquote warehouse and then that so then you can you can then you could then compete then you could then compete with the likes of amazon and you could basically get stuff to people same day delivery um, next day delivery like that would be an amazing service for now of course i know it's probably a bit easier for them to kind of move and be a bit more agile in terms of being the middleman so all you need is basically a laptop and a space to kind of authenticate shoes uh, but it'll be cool to kind of see that progression kind of take uh, forth especially if you need imp- especially if you kind of implement some machine learning techniques and kind of spot fakes and that sort of malarkey i think that'd be amazing but i saw this article about farfetch state acquiring stadium because i thought it was interesting because you know for the most part farfetch is pretty gobshit the website i think the website design or the ui ux whatever it may be is horrible to use um whenever their shopping links come up on you on google i always click off of them i'm not sure if anyone else does the same thing so interesting to see how they're going to if they're going to um put some of their funk on stadium goods or if they're going to steer in a whole different direction i don't know what they're going to do but um this article on business and fashion sort of details some of the things actually i think this is another article here actually that kind of says a bit better but let me see if it's available stadium goods yeah Let's put it up on here on the screen. So as it says here, uh, Farfetch has acquired Stadium Goods, a fashion platform is seeking to gain an edge in an increasing competitive online luxury space, picking up uh, the growing streetwear consignment marketplace. It's the first major move uh, since going public in September. Farfetch announced Wednesday that it is acquiring sneaker and streetwear marketplace stadium goods in a deal that values the business at 250 million, which is insane. Well done, man. Um, the London-based fashion e-commerce platform is aiming to extend its reach in the growing luxury sneakers and streetwear market as millennials account for a growing percentage of luxury sales and competitors are engaged in a digital land grab, which is very, very true. So I'd imagine Farfetch probably wanted to make a move into the sneaker 
um, business or industry. And instead of kind of like, you know, um, doing it there on their own, they would much rather buy an already established platform such as Stadium Goods, uh, acquire their talent, bring them all in house and then kind of run it through their system. I assume that's what they want to do. Now, of course, most acquisitions are not going to go that easily or that well. You only have to look at what happened with Kevin Systrom and co when uh, Facebook acquired them and they, they just left. I don't, it's kind of like a, it kind of like um, signals the 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 uh, the beginning of the end for the original employees, obviously, because you kind of get drawn into another company and you have to kind of go underneath their rules, their direction, whatever it may be. They might fuck up your product. So of course, the end is soon to come. But it's interesting kind of acquisition going forward in terms of the industry and where it's kind of steering itself towards. So it kind of sees like you know, as much as these fashion commentators want to bemoan the um, resurgence of streetwear, this kind of shows you that that streetwear is going nowhere. I think the idea of the idea of luxury that once prevailed within some of the fashion columns or within some of these people that are uh, um what you call it angry that streetwear has kind of got a foothold i think it's it, there's no going back now the idea of modern luxury being you know crocodile skin trainers or crocodile skin shoes is gone has long gone now luxury can be a webbed belt luxury can be a pair of sunglasses you know uh, modern day luxury has been reinterpreted in the streetwear lens and i'm all for it anyway the, the article continued farfetch's first partner with stadium goods they can sign a resale of rare limited edition shoes on a distribution deal in april 2018 bringing a small section of products sold on stadium goods to farfetch which is cool after the deal closes stadium goods full living will be available for farfetch users which is fucking insane stadium goods will continue to operate independently while tapping into farfetch logistics and delivery capabilities we know that's not true they're, they're going to be independent but only for us uh, only for as long as they can stomach it which i know for again for the guys that found it i think it's amazing what a good glow up for them so i hope they they cashed out but that is you know there is there's no guarantee that that's going to last that well i think the only company that's been able to do that no they actually didn't get acquired did they and i know sneaker stuff got some investment from another company and i remember they made a blog post detailing that no, don't worry guys we, we didn't get acquired i think they just got some investment so they kind of gave up a bit of equity in their in their company which is maybe a bit different and kind of getting totally absorbed by a big conglomerate such as farfetch um the world's largest e-commerce player, Farfetch. It's, it's the world's largest, but it's not good, is it? It's not very good. I don't know who actually uses Farfetch and buys stuff from there. Um, I, uh, people do, of course. That's why they're the largest, I'm assuming. Um, but to the con to discerning fashion um, um, enthusiasts, you're not going to use Farfetch to buy your goods, are you? Really? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Um, uh, uh, matches and Richmond's York Nickapot are locked in a race to uh, add um, new services and technologies through investments, acquisitions, and internal research and development in order to stay ahead of the pack, generate higher margins, and become the go-to platform for consumers and brands, according to BOF and McKinsey State of Fashion Report. Which is true because you know the the fashion but bu the buyers of the buyers of luxury or the buyers of fashion or the buyers of streetwear now they're getting younger and younger and younger you know you only have to look at pages such as like the basement or the comments that get left in kind of you know instagram posts on shops that update you know showing you lookbooks of images and stuff of new items that are coming into a store and you can just gauge by the words that are used by the people that are leaving the comments if you click through their profiles that the discerning fashion customer is a young 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 like they're not as old as they used to be back in the day. And, you know, for, for the most part, the stuff you're seeing in the runways, logo heavy, bright, bright, bright primary colors, um, really cool, interesting materials, um, limited edition drops, all this sort of stuff. You know, loads of brands are kind of doing that kind of streetwear model like Burberry did with the t-shirts and the hoodies and stuff that Ricardo t shirt designed. There's a real move to kind of get that customer. Everyone wants that customer to kind of get on board with what they're doing. Um, so it's no surprise that some of these companies are saying okay let's look at our runway let's look at who what we got to coming up let's look at the things that we want to do in the next few years and if you've got a, if you've got a kid that's going to be brand loyal to gucci who's 15 now you've got a long long time to sell him shit right so it makes come it makes complete sense to kind of tap into a, uh, a marketplace like um stadium goods where this same kid that's buying gucci jeans or is buying the Gucci goes hoodie and shit is most definitely going to buy something of stadium goods. So you're kind of tying it all into one platform, which I kind of get and um, fully, fully understand. So yeah, th this is a big, big shift. I hope again, the, the founders of, um, um, the founders of stadium goods here, I think they've mentioned it here, actually, what do they say here? Stadium goods co-founder and chief executive, John McFeeters said farfetch international reach would be a major boost of business. Of course, they so can tap into that distribution. They figured, um, they figured out a lot of things that we are still learning. Uh, said McFee is and co-founder Jed first met Neves a year ago and began the conversation that led to a deal. So it's a, it's a, it's a year in the making. So yeah, that's quite cool to see. 
again um shifting nature of sneaker industry multi-billion dollar in industry where a company like farfetch acquiring stadium goes to 250 million right and yet these kind of these companies or these brands still want to give you the illusion that these shoes are limited edition that they can only produce a certain amount yet they're churning them out um at a flipping breakneck speed something has to give something has to give which is why sometimes some of the limited edition shoes are getting devalued because you go on StockX, and especially for me i don't care because i'm not buying shit because there's a limited i'm buying stuff because i like it i'm a i'm a i'm a discerning uh sneaker head i'm not like someone's just gonna buy stuff for the sake of it which is some people that do do that no problem not have an issue with that but even for those people that are buying stuff that is limited and they want to buy it because it's only certain made certain amount made of it when you go on StockX and you can pick it up for a hundred dollars uh, over retail it kind of you know the 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 mystique of it the allure of it is kind of you know it kind of washes away because there's no demand for it because it's been oversaturated you only have to look at some of the recent releases on StockX, and some of them don't go for it's, it's it, unless it's an off-white collabo they don't even go for double what they sold for retail and that's the standard markup that most people most resellers are kind of aiming for resellers argument i think has long and died i think that's died away now i think no, no one's really um consciously saying you know bemoaning that resellers are spoiling the sneak industry i think in the beginning they were if anything they were um giving uh brand and merchandisers the wrong impression as to what was actually popping on the streets and what was actually popular because things were just selling out and it was assuming that okay people must love this kind of model and they were, they were over buying um that particular model for the next season and then they were getting you know left with uh dead stock of a particular model that wasn't necessarily um on brand no it wasn't necessarily trendy but might have had a bit of a spike of interest during those years um i only have to look at flipping nike vandals when they first came out um the kind of retro of those they were everywhere um, then loads of stores kind of cottoned on really late they kind of over indexed and overstocked themselves of nike vandals and then they were left with they were left on the sales rack for i for flipping months upon months which kind of again uh devalued the model itself devalued the brand so the, the reseller thing has kind of died down i think now what people are realizing is that it's the brands themselves that are fucking everyone over they're fucking over the stores by making them carry certain lines in order to kind of stock the limited edition thing uh they're fucking over the brand itself because you know they're devaluing it by making so much of the item and they're fucking over the uh the customer who wants to just to wear the shoe because they're purposely limiting the distribution purposely limiting the manufacturing um of the shoe in order to create this fake sense of scarcity that doesn't really exist there's too many people if farfetch is buying Stadium because of 250 million people, 250 million dollars. Um, sneaker culture isn't a fringe or a niche interest anymore. It's not on the underground. It's per it's permeated into pop culture. I remember there was a time when I used to watch TV where if someone on TV was wearing a limited edition shoe, we used to freak out take a picture of it and upload it into a forum. Like, oh my God, never guess who was wearing this. Now, no one does that anymore because there's fan accounts or there's uh, accounts such as a, a celebrity vice, for instance, that will post up images of people wearing clothes and shit or people wearing cool trainers and no one bats an eyelid. It's not that, it's not that incredible anymore. Everyone's wearing cool shit. Everyone's got a little 14 year old kid that goes out and gets cool stuff for LeBron James or whatever other player it is or like, um, I don't know, those name me a nick jonas person right that everyone's got a kid a connect that kind of buys them shoes not that incredible anymore it's permeating to pop culture yet these brands still want to pretend like you know limited edition shoes is the way to go and again they're only killing it for themselves sooner rather than later the bottom will fall out from it um again um, i hope so i hope stadium goods are able to kind of squeeze as much as they can out of the deal but you know 250 million nowadays in this climate with the way with the way limited edition shoes are going and the the the, the breakneck speed that they're kind of churning them out I'm not sure if that's that's as good as the deal as it looks looks like on paper but again what do i know i'm just a young boy from stratford talking shit into a microphone looking at a webcam with these fucking shitty glasses that i picked up from, from bloody assos it is what it is <laughs> anyway um next up on the list here ooh, is um oh yeah um this is quite big news jw anderson moves to paris um uh, as of i think you've saw i think the last few seasons there's quite been quite a big shift of um designers moving and showing their collections in paris especially menswear designers i think paris has now become the go-to place i mean i'm assuming because of buying season two i'm assuming because of showrooms i'm assuming because most of the press are there i'm assuming because just like um, new, new york is maybe new york is dying in terms of hip-hop but 
the the it, the music industry still lives in New York, all the big record labels are still there, so people have to still you know pass through New York in order to kind of get deals done, which I assume the same sort of thing happening in fashion. I'm not plugged into it, I'm not sure what it is, but there's been a concerted effort from some of the biggest brands or some of the bigger brands kind of showing their menswear collections in Paris, and I kind of uh, had this, you know, and you know Virgil obviously is an, it's kind of one of the the beacons of it, who's kind of you know that debuted his collection is off white and debuted his men's Louis Vuitton menswear collection in Paris, but now it's transpired that one of the most talented designers on the scene, J.W. Anderson, is going to be debuting his menswear collection for Luebe, or not debuting, showing his menswear collection uh, for Luebe in Paris too. He normally shows uh, as part of London Fashion Week, so it's going to be interesting to see. We're losing quite a few big guys in London Fashion Week, especially the young uh, the young guys that are kind of pushing things forward. There are a few newer ones that are kind of still there and still kind of flying that um, flag for us, but it's kind of sad not to see him in London, but it'll be interesting to see what he does in Paris. But it's also an indication that maybe um, especially taking our thought about the other day thinking about the British Fashion Awards the other day that maybe we might see Samuel Ross from a Cold War debuting in Paris too um, it could it, it will make all the sense in the world to be honest considering you know Heron Preston from the New Guards group who's also part of the uh, off-white kind of umbrella he shows in paris um a few other people are showing in paris at the moment too um there's rumors of clot um showing in paris too added to the list are going to be there showing their menswear collection as well so i wouldn't be surprised if you saw a cold war uh, debuting there in paris i saw this news pop up i'll read a little bit of the excerpt here blah 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 what does it say here so yeah the power of paris cat of carol never ceases to attract that's where Kanye west went in at first and spent all that money debuting that collection that people didn't really like that much but yeah, so it says, uh, next January, Paris Fashion Runway season has attracted several new star designers, including J.D. Anderson, Celine, Jill Sander, and the the state's position as the first among equals in the world's fashion capitals. Um, Anderson will stage his first ever menswear show uh, um, on French soil, moving from London after almost a decade of activity there. According to a statement announcing um, new entrance of the official calendar on Tuesday by the Fédération de la Haute Couture et de la Mode, uh, French um, fashion houses governing body, Anderson will also take second a second bow in Paris at Louis Bay. Also, oh, okay, he's debuting his menswear show for his um, namesake brand and he's also showing Luebe in Paris amazing um uh his uh, so far new stage menswear design in the city uh while Celine will make his debut menswear show in general which I'm not sure people are gonna be that's um excited about especially after seeing what we saw um the other <laughs> during his debut last last season uh, following on from the debut of Corey collection in September um in other developments Joe Sander will stage their first ever menswear runway show in Paris too which would be quite cool because obviously Joe Sander is um now spearheaded by Lucas uh, Luke Mia sorry his wife who used to be the former designers used to be the former creative directors for um supreme so that'd be cool to see them um though founded by a german designer and owned by a spanish german uh, japanese group sander has always staged men's show in milan generally in its main italian headquarters paris also welcomed back raf simmons oh for a second successive season after it's two years when he presented men's in new york which is interesting again everyone oh yeah because he came back didn't he last season what i'm talking about um and obviously, uh, provincial star Simon Port Jackins will be there. In other highlights, we're going to see Futi, Fu, 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 Fumito Ganuro from um, Comme des Garçons fame. And also uh, Taki Mahiro. Taki Mahiro, how do you pronounce his name? From the soloist, former, former designer of number nine. He's going to be showing in Paris too, which is great. Um, Heron Preston will take to the runways in Paris as well. And... Uh, Oh, and Vetements coming back as well after a season out, I think, in Paris. No, no season out. So, yeah, the new calendar entrants are going to be Clot, Maison Kitsuni, who just hired the former designer from um, Phoebe Philo to take on to there, One Culture, uh, System, and Wendy Kim, which is an amazing, actually, little brand that kind of looks, it's, kind of reminds you me of the old school Vetements, very um, grungy very techno inspired kind of clothing loads of club culture references so yeah that should be hotting up hotting in interesting what clot do clot are fucking killing it, innit? they got the jordan club that they did recently they, they had that um intersections kind of conference video they did in hong kong and um, now they're showing in that like, clot is a fucking behemoth man uh, that the annual turnover of clot must be insane the amount of money they make mate not including all the brand endorsements and shit kevin poon edison chen fucking smashed it with clot like somehow they've managed to steer that ship through 
loads of different eras and still maintain a thriving business maybe it's because they tapped into the chinese market because they're not afraid of being chinese i think that's something that's i can really credit them you know they're always making nods to chinese culture even though you know edison chen is kind of steeped in american streetwear and history but i like that they're always making nods back to china 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 loads of loads of launch loads of store activations it's fucking cool and maybe that's why they've you know they've got such a low fan base out there and even though it might not be as cool as it once was in the u in europe or in the americas for the most part they must fucking kill it in asia absolutely kill it which is great to see so yeah um london i mean paris fashion week is going to be hotting up and um, it's a shame really to see all these designers leaving london for the most part well victoria beckham's come back to london fashion week which is great uh, great to see her in london um that all that time spent in new york was fucking annoying as fuck so it's good to see victoria beckham flying the flag for london but yeah um great shows who knows isn't it might see a cold war um debuting in paris that's my guess i don't know any information inside info but I'm assuming we're going to see a cold war there. If Heron Preston is moving over there and showing his collection, then it might make sense to kind of join the big hitters and kind of, you know, Iron Sharpens Iron debuting your show in Paris would be sick, I reckon. And again, would open up a cold war to a whole wider audience of buyers across Europe. Um, what else is on my list here? Bada, 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 bing. Um, Etsy and... Um, Oh, I, did you pronounce it Etsy? How do you pronounce that name? Etsy, the, the kind of stacked shoes. I really like these things. I've, I've been meaning to buy them for a while. Um, they're the kind of trainer that everyone's sort of been wearing lately. I'm sure you guys have seen them. They're sort of like stacked. You call them Etsy, Etsy, Etsy's? I really like them. Again, maybe it's not. It's it's maybe it's a it's a shoe that's quite trendy, right? It's a shoe that maybe is not going to last. Uh, bar a few seasons but again i don't buy my shoes i don't buy anything in my wardrobe based on trends so i'm not that bothered but i know some people might be a little bit hesitant to buy something like this because you know it's, it's a little bit trendy looking and it might not you know look good with other things later on because you know it kind of does um it kind of does ask for you to to wear a more uh loose fitting trousers you're not necessarily going to wear these with skinnies and it make it look good it's kind of cool for wearing maybe wider pants but i like the look of these trainers um i'm not sure what the actual what's the actual model called uh suede dune i think dune right angel dune shoe i really like them those are my favorites i've been having an eye on them for a while um so yeah angel i think they're called angel right so etsy angel shoe i really like the look of them so i've been liking them for a while i really like the chip they've got a chelsea boot too it looks cool this looks amazing isn't it? in suede um so they've got a chelsea boot that i've been having iron up for a while which i think is here yeah this is the one actually on farfetch too which is fucking funny after i just trashed them but yeah on farfetch just go straight to the store but yeah i think these look cool these chelsea boots look fucking amazing by them They're kind of stacked as well i think they look really really nice so yeah man look at that with the outfit it looks so nice and again i think that outfit too looks a bit dead because it's got skinny jeans rolled up i don't think anyone's wearing it close again that styling is horrible in it farfetch is a bit again it's they stock really good brands and stuff or whatever but it's a bit like it's a bit amateurish isn't it? the way they put stuff together styling wise they're really gonna have to level up a little bit stadium because it's not gonna doesn't look good but anyway yeah so um it makes some good things and at the moment they've got a gender neutral collection that they're putting together with h&m that i just saw um debuted actually on paul's magazine i've got it loaded up here actually it loads up in time it says gender neutral but i'm not sure really sure why because it looks amazing to me it doesn't look that gen doesn't look that crazy um they really, probably didn't need to call it a gender neutral collection i think and for the most part people could see what was maybe a bit too risky for them and just not cop it but yeah um it says your global fashion label h&m has just unveiled images of its latest collaboration with fellow swedish brand it it is it is i don't know how you pronounce it uh gender neutral collection uh arriving in the color palette of uh, i don't know what color palette is i'm just gonna read it it's people that write copy for these websites and it must be horrible especially if you haven't got any other inside information or you're not really analyzing the collection you just end up writing about what you're going to see here itself and it's a bit dumb but hey um so yeah this jacket is fucking cool so it's sort of like a pvc coach jacket i'm assuming right it looks like a coach jacket but it's got it's a little bit elasticated at the bottom which coach jackets are usually are not um and then it's got like a little bit of a ring pull for the zip you know going on those kind of you know bdsm vibes I fucking love it, man. I think it looks fucking cool as fuck. Um, and again, um, the same jacket. Is that the same jacket, right? Or is that the same, not the same jacket? I'm not too sure. But yeah, that looks cool. 
and then sort of like a snake skin rain jacket it looks quite nice and it comes in a button up shirt which i'm sure will do really well with people that like those pattern shirts a nice little sweatshirt with a utopia print screen on the front the cut of the jumper looks fairly nice no wrangler and sleeve which is annoying that doesn't matter favorite type of sleeve i like on a jumper but no nice little boxy fit maybe that's kind of in at the moment um again i think maybe they they are reversible it seems like right maybe it looks seems like yeah reversible sweatshirts nice tees and nice mute colors box nice boxy fits i think for the t-shirts which goes back to the gender neutral theme um some nice mum some nice mum jeans there the boots are fucking cool i like the boots my boots are really fucking cool again it's a collaboration with H&M, so i'm assuming the quality won't be the best because they're going to be you know they're going to be fairly um well priced in order to kind of attract as many customers as possible but they look fairly cool and again they've got another train so yeah maybe this train might not be a good time to buy especially doing h&m collaboration it's going to be fucking everywhere but it looks f so good man i really like this shoe i really like the shoes that they make especially even this kind of speed runner sort of thing they make stacked up as well it looks fucking amazing so yeah i recommend you check that out gender neutral collection with um etsy at the moment and some slippers too some slides everyone needs a pair of slides, which i might actually need to get a pair of i've always i never really got anything to kind of go out on a quick run out to the stores i mentioned earlier let's go to tesco express and pick up some snacks and stuff i never have stuff i never have the right you know stuff to wear just to quickly go out and pop out i've always had to take my laces or put them on so i understand the slides thing it was it, was, it got a bit annoying because it felt like it was like a boy version of wearing um uggs right in the in in, in the ends what girls usually do so it kind of looks a bit too sloppy especially with the guys i've got in my area they've always i don't know what it is i'm not sure if it's a black thing but they always wear sandals too small for their feet so their feet are always kind of enveloping over because or maybe they just have like wide feet syndrome like i do so no matter what size you buy they're always going to look like your feet are always going to look bigger than the sandal itself but um i need i think i need something that falls in between it uh, maybe those easy sandals might be a good example but they're, they're sold out everywhere i'm assuming isn't it? they're quite fairly priced actually those easy sandals just very very surprising but yeah etsy gender neutral collection check it out check it in because it looks fucking incredible i think anyway it looks pretty pretty nice me like it me like it um what else is on the list here ba 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 oh aliyah made jordan ones yeah they look really nice so this is the girl i mentioned before previously she's like um an influencer on instagram so she's always wearing really cool outfits i really like some of her amazing margella looks she hangs around with all the virgil and that lot um a fairly pretty girl but uh, she's always she just drops really well i think her swag quote unquote is really really well done um especially for the influencer i see on social and she's done a collaboration with jordan which you know um i think i was quite critical than i just invested the collaboration with jordan which didn't make any sense i just think nowadays um jordan brand isn't what we knew of it in the past you know right um i remember kanye west and his whole cohorts of friends like don c and stuff were a little bit annoyed when they weren't getting the props that they uh they didn't get the props that they deserved i'm I, i'm surprised during the time because they kind of popularized jordan retros to the kind of general consumer and i'm surprised they didn't do a collaboration i know don c did a collaboration a few collaborations with nike and himself but i'm surprised that whole group didn't do a collaboration a, a retro colorway flip of a jordan there was a time when they were all wearing jordan ones all wearing jordan fours like all wearing jordan threes like the whole crew um and nothing happened nothing kind of came of it and i think maybe that was self-explanatory because i think that was during a time when jordan brand were very protective of their brand they weren't letting anyone under the sun kind of do a collaboration but now things have changed of course with farfetch acquiring stadium for 250 million dollars have you seen the collection here everyone under the sun is getting a collaboration because everyone wants to sell their shoes because shoes they're, they're finding it hard to sell these shoes right you only have to look at the band jordan once to kind of see what's happening you have to look at the um the kind of um repeated nature of the retros that keep coming out again and again and again black toes this that cement freeze they just they don't stop with the fucking collaborations with jordan so it goes to show that mainland jordan isn't selling as well as it should be selling um of course because you know there's only so many jordan ones one person could need but that being said i think Aliyah made it a very 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 good job um of her collaboration again it's only a colorway flip but she really really uh utilized uh the the model at hand and kind of did a bit of a nod to the biotech dunks that came out a while back and i'm assuming there's a tie-in now because you know virgil that lot are trying to uh bring back the dunk so maybe there was a kind of nod to that but i really like how she did it and how she put it forward um it's up here as well i'm showing on the screen so all suede upper which is fucking it's gonna be lush as fuck i'm assuming it's got lining because the the one that i liked um was the dunk that had no lining the nl dunk that because i always had an idea about doing that as on the jordan i think that would look quite cool but i'm assuming there is a lining on it because i can see a little bit of rubber on top there but it's all suede it looks like upper wise uh red toe with blue with navy blue on the toe box and kind of like a peach what kind of we'd call it a peach 
on the insole here, mid and a bit of purple and navy essence, but with a grey swoosh. And I love the off-white sole. That's something a lot of the brands have been doing quite recently now. Because it, because I think, again, maybe it's a nod to the Tom Sachs um, Mars Yard that I, ha I have, but it picks up dirt really well and it kind of ages the sneaker without you wearing it too much if you want to have that kind of distressed look. Something similar where they've done with the Balenciaga Triple S where they've kind of, you know, added those kind of like dust uh, tea stains on the sole. But I really like it. I think the off-white look on, Jordan, on on shoes in general look amazing. Like even the, the off-white um, Air Force Ones, the ones that came out during the Complex Con that are just completely white and then you chuck on an off-white sole, it just offsets the kind of like the bright, bright white with the off-white really, really well. And then again, it reminds me of kind of the vintage shoes I used to buy back in the in, on on eBay, you know, the kind of because the first thing to go would be the sole cause, because of the polyurethane that was used there. But yeah, the, the shoes look amazing. I'm not, I'm not really sure what the northern or fur is on, on the on the tongue, but again, I'm not mad at the little detail there. But I'm, I think these are going to be fairly popular with um, male uh, buy, sneaker buyers too. I'm sure the girls are going to be all over these, but I'm sure there's going to be loads of dudes that are going to buy them, especially if you take off the little fur thing on the top or if you leave them on, because depending. I'm just not found the wax laces. I always, I'm always, I'm always, I'm always going to chuck those out. So that's something I'll kind of switch out straight away but yeah a really nice collaboration i think she did a really good job she's got a little signature here on the inside it must be nuts man for a girl like her like an influencer that's always been wearing kind of jordan type shoes to get a collaboration with jordan even though for me it's like kind of diluting the brand a little bit they were so protective of the brand a while back and now they're kind of letting anyone under the sun do collaborations for me it's a little bit you know as a sneakerhead i'm a little bit like ugh, but true by it but i think personally for her it must be such an amazing feeling to kind of like now be you know have your own fucking jordan one with your own little signature on the inside it's fucking insane and it's so distinctive as well what it looks like i mean there's no there's nothing else out there in the market that looks anything like it and this is coming out when uh viatech dunk on december 22nd on yep i'm sure it's going to sell out straight away so there's no way that's going to you know that's not going to sell out that's going to be very very popular so yeah she did a very very good job on those um via tech dunks anyway um that might be a good place to end it because we're already at one one hour 20 and i've been blabbering on too much about people's via tech dunks and shit got loads of other things i need to catch up on um which i'll probably update on the show tomorrow and save some topics as well as per usual but thanks again for tuning in to the excellent zinger show this will be episode number 131 imagine all these episodes i've been doing of late imagine if i kept this consistency when i was um started this four years ago imagine where i would have been imagine but let's not cry a spilt more because we are where we are now and everything happens for a reason motherfuckers but anyway thanks so much for tuning in episode number 131 of Xeno Zinger show as always check out my site xenozinger.com for all information regarding me if you want to see a full list of the books that I've been reading there's going to be a, a link to, attached to the uh, description of the show notes too so you can check it out and you can buy a copy if you want on the old Amazon store or wherever else you purchase the books from but apart from that it's been a pleasure talking to you as per usual I'll see you again guys tomorrow thank you for tuning in Agostino out.